psychological examination. Because of the extreme importance of the hand in carrying out fine delicate tasks, and also because it functions as a sensory organ, the detailed neurological examination of the hand and wrist region must be performed. The neurological examination of the more proximal upper extremity, as shown in the video program, the cervical spine and neurological examination of the upper extremities must also be performed. Sensory examination. The skin of the hand is supplied by three main peripheral nerves. Although overlap may be considerable, the median nerve supplies mainly the palmar aspect of the thumb, index, middle, and radial half of the ring fingers. And dorsally, the index, middle, and radial half of the ring fingers from the PIP joint distally. The ulnar nerve supplies both the palmar and dorsal aspects of the little finger and the only one half of the ring finger. The radial nerve supplies the remaining dorsal area of the thumb, metacarpal region, and the proximal phalangeal region of the index and radial half of the middle finger. To test the autonomous zone of the radial nerve, check for sensation dorsally in the web space between the thumb and the index finger. For the median nerve, check the radial palmar border of the index finger, and for the ulnar nerve, the ulnar palmar border of the little finger. The palmar surface of the hand region can also be divided into dermatomes. C6 supplies the radial aspect of the palm, thumb, and index finger. C7 supplies the mid-palm and the mid-finger. And C8, the ulnar aspect of the palm, ring, and little fingers. Each of these dermatomes must be carefully tested with all of the sensory modalities, such as pinprick, bell, light touch, temperature, warm, and cold. It is extremely important to test two-point discrimination in the hand which at the fingertip should be less than six millimeters. Motor examination. When testing motor function, the examiner is reminded to examine individual muscles or groups of muscles. Palpate the tendon or muscle and record the strength according to the zero to five muscle grading chart. Where zero indicates no evidence of contractility, and five indicates complete range of motion against full resistance. Always remember to compare the strength of one muscle or group of muscles with its counterpart on the opposite side. Wrist extension. Extensor carpi radialis longus, extensor carpi radialis brevis, extensor carpi ulnaris. C678 radial nerve. Stabilize the forearm and instruct the patient to extend or cock up the wrist. And with the palm of the other hand, attempt to force the wrist into palm flexion. Assess muscle grade on the 0 to 5 scale, and in the normal patient, it would not be possible to move the wrist out of the extended position. Flexion. Flexor carpi radialis, C67 medium nerve. Flexor carpi ulnaris, C8 T1 ulnar nerve. Instruct the patient to make a fist. This effectively eliminates the long finger flexors from acting as wrist flexors. Have the patient flex the wrist and attempt to pull the wrist out of the flexed position. Finger extensors. Extensor digitorum communis, extensor indices proprius, 
Extensor digital minimum, C678 radial nerve. Stabilize the wrist in the neutral position and instruct the patient to flex the proximal interphalangeal joints to eliminate any contribution to finger extension by the intrinsic muscles of the hand. Then ask the patient to extend the metacarpal phalangeal joints and test strength by pushing on the dorsal aspect of the proximal phalanx, attempting to push the fingers into flexion. The extensor indices proprius can be tested individually by keeping the third, fourth, and fifth metacarpal phalangeal joints in flexion. And likewise, the extensor digital minimi can be isolated by maintaining the other fingers in flexion at the metacarpal phalangeal joints. Finger flexion. Flexor strength must be tested individually at each of the distal interphalangeal proximal interphalangeal and metacarpal phalangeal joints as each of the finger joints is primarily flexed by different muscles. Distal interphalangeal joint flexor digitorum profundus C7 to T1 median and ulnar nerve. Stabilize the metacarpal phalangeal joints and proximal interphalangeal joints in extension. Then instruct the patient to flex the tip of the finger. In this manner, only the flexor digitorum profundus is being tested. Test each finger in turn. Proximal interphalangeal joint. Flexor digitorum superficialis, C7 to T1 median nerve. With the exception of the finger being tested, stabilize the other fingers in extension and instruct the patient to flex the finger at the proximal interphalangeal joint and test against resistance. In this position, only the flexor digitorum superficialis is acting and note that the patient is not able to use the flexor digitorum profundus to flex the fingertip. Thumb flexion. Interphalangeal joint, flexor pollicis longus, C7 to T1, median nerve. Metacarpal phalangeal joint, flexor pollicis brevis. Instruct the patient to touch the hypothenar eminence with the thumb. Test the flexor tendon strength by attempting to pull the patient's thumb away from the palm, first exerting pressure on the distal phalanx to test the flexor pollicis longus, then on the proximal phalanx to test both the flexor pollicis longus and brevis. Thumb extension. Interphalangeal joint, extensor pollicis longus, C7, C8, radial nerve, metacarpal phalangeal joint, extensor pollicis brevis, C6, C7, radial nerve. With the palm placed on the table, instruct the patient to lift the thumb up away from the table. Attempt to flex the interphalangeal joint by pressing over the distal phalanx to test the extensor pollicis longus. Pressure applied over the proximal phalanx tests both the extensor pollicis longus and brevis muscles. Intrinsic muscles. The intrinsic muscles of the hand have both their origin and insertion within the hand and do not cross the wrist joint. These include the muscles of the femur eminence, adductor pollicis brevis, median nerve, flexor pollicis brevis, median and ulnar nerves, and opponens pollicis, median nerve. Hypothenar eminence, adductor digiti minimi, ulnar nerve, Flexor digiti minimi brevis, ulnar nerve, and opponens digiti minimi, ulnar nerve. Other intrinsic muscles of the hand include the adductor pollicis, ulnar nerve, lumbricals, median and ulnar nerves, and dorsal and palmar interossei, ulnar nerve. Femur eminence. The muscles of the femur eminence are tested as a group 
by asking the patient to touch the thumb to the tip of the little finger so that the nails are parallel. They can also be tested by having the patient place the dorsum of the hand on the table and raise the thumb so that it is at right angles to the palm. By palpating the femur eminence during either movement, the examiner will be able to appreciate the contraction of the femur muscles. Thumb adduction. Adductor pollicis C8 T1 ulnar nerve. Instruct the patient to hold a piece of paper with both hands between the thumb opposed to the radial side of the proximal phalanx of the index finger and to pull the hands apart. Weakness of the adductor pollicis is manifest by flexion of the interphalangeal joint of the thumb, and this is called Fermont sign. Hypothenar eminence. Instruct the patient to bring the little finger away from the ring finger against resistance along the ulnar border and palpate the region of the hypothenar eminence. Finger abduction, dorsal interossei, abductor digiti minimi, on the nerve. Instruct the patient to spread the fingers away from the midfinger, then successively try and oppose the index and mid, mid and ring, and the ring and middle fingers. Observe and palpate the first dorsal interosseous muscle as the patient extends and radially abducts the index finger against resistance. Finger adduction. Palmar interossei on the nerve. Instruct the patient to keep the fingers opposed while the examiner attempts to separate successively the index and mid, mid and ring, and ring and little fingers. Finger adduction can also be tested by asking the patient to hold a piece of paper between the fingers while the examiner attempts to pull the paper away. Care must be taken to ensure that the patient does not use the thumb or other fingers to substitute for weakness. Pinch strength. Pinch is an important function of the hand and pinch strength can be assessed by having the patient oppose the tip of the thumb to the tip of the index finger to form a knoll. With your index finger, attempt to break the pinch or separate the thumb and index finger. Note in the normal, it is not possible to break the pinch and there is no collapse of the hole. In a similar manner, attempt to break opposition of the thumb to the tips of the middle, ring, and middle fingers respectively. Lateral pinch, three-point pinch, and opposition pinch can also be assessed by means of a pinch meter. Grasp strength. Assess grasp strength by asking the patient to grasp the examiner's fingers with both hands simultaneously. A more objective measurement of grasp strength can be made by measurement of grasp on a hand dynamometer. Vascular examination. The hand receives its blood supply from both the radial and the ulnar arteries, which anastomose to form the superficial and deep palmar arches. To assess the circulatory status of the hand, note the general color of the skin, and also test capillary filling by squeezing the nail bed. Radial artery. Palpate the radial styloid on the volar aspect of the wrist 
and progress in a minor direction until the radial pulse is localized. Ulnar artery. The ulnar artery can be palpated just proximally and radial to the pisiform bone. Allen test. The Allen test is used to evaluate the patency of the ulnar and radial arterial supply to the hand. Note that when the patient is asked to open and close the fist rapidly several times, the palm and fingers appear blanched in comparison to the other hand. To perform the Allen test, instruct the patient to rapidly open and close the fist several times, and then while the fist is maintained in a clenched position, with digital pressure occlude both the radial and the ulnar arteries. Instruct the patient to open the hand, noting its blanched appearance, and release the ulnar artery. Ascertain if the palm and all five digits regain the redness and the time taken. Repeat the test, and this time release the radial artery. Again, noting the extent and time taken for blanching to disappear. Sluggishness or failure of the hand and fingers to flush suggests partial or complete obliteration of the artery being tested. A modification of the Allen test can be used to assess the patency of the ulnar or radial digital branches to each individual finger. Instruct the patient to rapidly open and close the fist several times, then with the thumb and index finger, occlude the digital arteries near the base of the proximal phalanx of the finger being tested while the fist is maintained in a closed position. Instruct the patient to open the hand and release the pressure on the radial digital branch and observe the extent and time taken for blanching to disappear. Repeat the test, this time releasing the pressure on the ulnar digital branch. Note that in the fingers, the terms ulnar and radial do not refer to the ulnar and radial artery, but merely to the side of the digit being tested. Special tests. Test for carpal tunnel syndrome. Compression of the medial nerve as it traverses through the carpal tunnel at the level of the wrist and proximal palm may result in decreased sensation in the medial nerve distribution of the hand and in extreme cases may also result in atrophy and weakness of the muscles of the femur eminence. Tenel sign. In response to tapping over the volar aspect of the wrist at the level between the pisiform and the tubercle of the trapezium or distal wrist crease, the patient with a carpal tunnel syndrome may report pain or paresthesias in the distribution of the median nerve. Phalen's test or wrist flexion test. Paresthesias or tingling may also be produced in the medial nerve distribution by maintaining the wrist in maximum flexion for at least one minute. A positive tenel sign and a positive phalen's test are indicative of compression of the medial nerve in the carpal tunnel. Decavan's tunis synovitis. As mentioned previously, Swelling and tenderness noted during palpation of the abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis tendons on the radial aspect of the wrist or crepitus detected during the motion suggests an inflammatory tenosynovitis. Finkelstein's test. Finkelstein's test is used to further confirm the diagnosis of Decavan's tenosynovitis. Instruct the patient to make a fist grasping the thumb in the palm. Stabilize the forearm with one hand and deviate the wrist in another direction with the other hand. Complaints of pain on the radial aspect of the wrist is further evidence of Decavan's tenosynovitis. Pain arising more distally at the base of the thumb may arise from carpal, first metacarpal arthritis and must not be confused with a positive Finkelstein's test. Another test which will give rise to pain on the radial aspect of the wrist in this condition is having the patient extend and adduct the thumb against resistance. Loss of finger flexion. 
If during the course of the examination incomplete finger flexion has been noted, the cause of this deficit must be determined by the examiner. Common extra-articular causes of finger flexion loss include the following. One, loss of function or continuity of the flexor digitorum superficialis. Two, loss of function or continuity of the flexor digitorum profundus. Three, tethering or adherence of the extensor tendons over the back of the wrist or hand, known as extrinsic extensor tightness. Four, intrinsic muscle tightness. Five, retinacular ligament tightness. The tests for flexor digitorum superficialis and flexor digitorum profundus function and integrity have been completed during the motor assessment of the neurological examination. Extrinsic extensor tightness. To test for extrinsic extensor tightness, maintain the wrist in the neutral position and passively extend the metacarpophalangeal joint. Then attempt to passively flex the proximal interphalangeal joint. Now flex the metacarpal phalangeal joint and passively flex the proximal interphalangeal joint. If the proximal interphalangeal joint will not flex fully when the NCP joint is flexed, this suggests tethering of the extensor tendons over the dorsum of the hand or wrist. Intrinsic muscle tightness. Hold the metacarpal phalangeal joint in slight extension and attempt to flex the proximal interphalangeal joint. If the proximal interphalangeal joint will not flex fully while the metacarpal phalangeal joint is in extension, this suggests tightness of the intrinsic muscles of the hand, the lumbricals and interossei. Now flex the metacarpal phalangeal joint and attempt to flex the proximal interphalangeal joint. With the metacarpal phalangeal joint flexed, the intrinsic muscles are relaxed and the range of flexion of the proximal interphalangeal joint should be increased. Retinacular ligament tightness. Flexion loss of the distal interphalangeal joint of the finger may be due to tightness of the retinacular ligaments. Stabilize the proximal interphalangeal joint in extension and attempt to passively flex the distal interphalangeal joint. If the distal interphalangeal joint will not flex, then allow the proximal interphalangeal joint to flex slightly and again test passive flexion. If flexion now occurs at the distal interphalangeal joint, this suggests tightness of the retinacular ligaments. While performing all of these tests, the examiner must remember that joint capsule contractures or intraarticular pathology may also limit motion. This concludes the detailed examination of the hand and wrist region. But the physician is reminded that an examination of related areas such as the elbow, shoulder, and cervical spine must also be carried out.